So now we know what adverse selection is. It's a type of market failure caused by asymmetric information. When one side of the market, either the buyers or the sellers, has more information about the value of the goods being sold, and as a result, uh, only the lowest quality participants remain in the market. We've seen a number of examples where that really can happen, and the outcome is pretty bad. This idea you have a market with only the least desirable participants, not generally what we want. So what can we do about it? What are some techniques for mitigating adverse selection? Well, if adverse selection is caused by asymmetric information, then a natural response would be to decrease the amount of information asymmetry by exposing more information about the quality of the goods being sold. So let's think about how that might work in the few examples that we discussed on the previous slide. In general, what this boils down to is giving you know, buyers, sellers, or both, uh, giving them the tools to signal that they are high value, that they are high quality. For example, let's revisit the market for lemons. Okay, so we have buyers and sellers. The sellers have good or bad cars. The sellers know whether the car is good or bad. The buyers do not. So here to reduce information asymmetry, we need to give the buyers more information about whether they're likely buying a good car or a bad car. Because then if a buyer knows or thinks that they're likely to be getting a good car, at that point, they'll be willing to pay uh, a high price for it. So how would you do this? How would you expose more information about car quality? Well, I'm sure you can think of a couple of ways that it is done or that it could be done. Um, I mean, you could use a trusted third party, like you could just have a mechanic have a look at the car and sort of diagnose it as either good or bad so that the buyer knows what they should be uh, paying for the car. And in particular, if it's a good car, the buyer knows they should be willing to pay uh, quite a bit. Another way you could do it is the seller could offer a warranty, right? Because the expected cost of offering a warranty, that expected cost is much higher if your car is bad than if it's good. So if a seller is willing to give you a quite favorable warranty, that's a strong signal that the seller does in fact uh, have a good car. So how about in the labor market? Remember, this is where we had workers and where we had firms. And the extreme form of adverse selection is that if the firms can't differentiate between higher and lower productivity workers, you can wind up with a market where only the lowest productivity workers remain and all of them earning a very low wage. So here it's the workers that have more information. They know their own productivity, uh, whereas the firms don't really know that much about it. So here the question is, how can we expose more information about workers' likely productivity to the firms so that they can make hiring decisions and compensation decisions accordingly. So one can imagine several ways that uh, workers might try to signal their uh, potential productivity to firms, but one way is you can interpret education as being a mechanism for doing this. Uh, so suppose, for the sake of argument, that there's, there's some kind of positive correlation between the productivity of a worker and how easy it is for someone to perform well at school. So certainly an imperfect assumption, but let's, let's just go with it for now. Under that assumption, it's less costly for a worker that's going to be productive to obtain degrees than it would be for an a unproductive worker. And what that means is that a, a, you know, a productive worker can signal their likely productivity by obtaining additional academic degrees because it's not as costly for them to do so in terms of the effort. So then when workers are so differentiated, firms at that point can pay workers differently. So workers with more education, uh, they can pay a higher wage to try to keep them in the labor market and benefit from their higher productivity. Now, I know that many of you are probably thinking, you know, look, I didn't really decide to attend Columbia or, you know, or some other college uh, because I wanted to signal to future firms my likely productivity. That wasn't really part of my calculation. And I believe you. I, I mean, education has a ton of direct benefits that are probably more, more foremost on your mind, right? You know, you learn cool stuff, you know, ideas and skills. You meet, you know, amazing other students, hopefully some amazing professors, uh, and it just sets you on the trajectory for the rest of your life, no doubt about it. But what I'm saying here is just that, you know, on top of all that, at least somehow implicitly, you can interpret you know, the way firms handle education uh, as being some kind of way of mitigating adverse selection uh, in the labor markets with higher education and indicating at least on average uh, more valuable workers that then thereby allows the firms uh, to pay them higher wages. Finally, let's revisit our, our last example, the market for online advertising, where the sellers were advertisers and the buyers were users and the good being sold uh, were clicks leading to landing pages. So here, uh, the platform, like say the search engine, uh, would be wise 
to uh, spend the time and resources to estimate the quality of various ads. So to do, say, offline computation to try to figure out themselves which of the uh, sponsored links are going to be spammy and which of the ones are going to be not, are, are not. And then to take that information that they figured out about how good various ads are and to export that information to the users. Okay, so remember here the, the information asymmetry is the sellers, the advertisers, are the ones with more information. A seller knows whether they're a spammer or not. A buyer, a user, does not necessarily know whether a link is a spam link or not. So the platform should figure it out and tell that information to the users to decrease uh, the uh, information asymmetry. Uh, for example, you could give the highest quality ads the most prominent placements on a page. And in fact, that's exactly what Google has been doing since the very, very early days uh, of that company. That's something that they got right very early on. And there's a bunch of benefits of doing this, right? So uh, you mitigate adverse selection, right? The, the high quality advertisers are, are gonna get prominent placement. They're gonna get lots of clicks. They're gonna be happy with their clicks. So they'll stay in the market. Uh, they won't exit. Uh, meanwhile, you know, users are going to be usually seeing pretty relevant landing pages. So they'll be willing to click at a healthy rate. Uh, and don't forget that these platforms, that's how they make their money. They collect a transaction fee whenever there's a click on a sponsored link. So the platform, uh, definitely wants there to be lots of clicks. Uh, and moreover, in contrast to the Yahoo example of kind of um, uh, turning to clickbaity ads uh, to exploit the current uh, clicks by users, uh, this way of doing it, you know, mitigating adverse selection and making sure it's the highest quality ads um, that are the most prominently placed and clicked on the most, that also is a more sustainable um, business model. So the search engine also protects its future search ad revenue uh, in this way. So those are the basics of adverse selection, what it is, many, many examples. We've mostly focused on kind of the very traditional examples, you know, the market for lemons, the market for health insurance, the labor market. We did talk about the market for online advertising, which is a little bit more in kind of our overarching narrative of understanding the technology platforms that we use uh, every day. Um, and what I do for the, I want to do for the last part uh, of this module is segue into a discussion of reputation systems, which are obviously super relevant for the kinds of markets uh, that we're talking about, the ones that have shown up in the 21st century uh, because of advances in computer science. So you're all familiar with reputation systems, whether on Amazon or other websites. Uh, and now that we've discussed adverse selection, you know, we can actually recognize that one of the points of a reputation system is in fact to mitigate adverse selection. So why is that? Why do reputation systems help with adverse selection? Well, it's because they expose additional information. So like one concrete example we could think about is a review site, you know, something like Yelp or Google reviews. So imagine that uh, we lived in a world where no restaurant reviews existed. Okay. And more generally, you know, as a diner, you had no way of differentiating between, you know, various restaurants, right? So maybe you're in some town as a tourist, you know, there's some main drag, you know, dotted with all of these restaurants and you really have no idea which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. In that case, there's going to be asymmetric information because a restaurant presumably knows whether it's a good restaurant or a bad restaurant. Now, as the diner, if you're basically just picking one of the restaurants on this block at random, uh, you should only be willing to pay for the expected value of a meal at an average restaurant. And uh, if there's lots of low quality restaurants, that might not be a very high price. And if you're not willing to pay a high enough price, then you might, that you might not be able to support the higher quality restaurants enough to stay in business, right? Because maybe running a higher quality restaurant, you know, maybe you use more expensive ingredients or you pay higher wages. In any case, you have higher costs and you can only operate if you get reasonably high prices. So in that case, if you cannot differentiate high and low quality restaurants and the going price is too low, the high quality restaurants are going to exit. And then once there's no high quality restaurants as a diner, now you're willing to pay even less for a meal. And so the end game here, if you continue this to its logical conclusion, um, is a scenario where the only restaurants still in business are the cheapest and the worst ones, like a bunch of fast food restaurants. Um, and then uh, yeah, everybody's paying just sort of like very little money to eat very badly, which is sort of not a culinary apocalypse we're hoping to avoid. Uh, and so reviews on you know, Yelp or Google reviews, they help avoid this problem uh, by exporting the information about restaurant quality uh, to the buyers, thereby reducing uh, information asymmetry. Right, so we're all used to reputation systems. We all use, you know, for example, websites and apps all the time. They make use of recommendation systems. We kind of intuitively know it's an important part uh, of the ecosystem. You know, but still, you know, it's worth taking a step back and really just getting clarity in your own mind and asking, you know, what, what problem is it actually that a reputation system is designed to solve? 
because then you can assess whether a reputation system is doing a good job or a bad job once you've decided on what it is it's supposed to be doing. And there's more, you know, there's more than one answer to this question, but the point on this slide is that you know, one of the things a reputation system is supposed to be doing is mitigating adverse selection. That's not the only thing. And on the next slide, I want to tell you about a different form of asymmetric information for which reputation systems are also relevant, namely moral hazard.